Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to do a quick review of the Retroid Pocket 4. So this is different than the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, which I reviewed earlier last month. Now, the difference between these two mostly is going to be the chipset, but then also the price. The 4 is going to be $150 before shipping, whereas the 4 Pro is $199. So in this video, I want to answer two different questions. The first is going to be whether or not the device itself is worth $150 plus shipping, but then also whether or not it's worth spending that additional $50 to get the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro instead. And so if you're in the market for one of these two devices, or maybe you already picked up one and you want to see what the competition is like, I think this is the video for you. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, let's start by talking about the differences between the Retro Pocket 4 and the 4 Pro. And like I mentioned, the majority is going to be the chipset as well as the price. The Retroid Pocket 4, which we're reviewing here today, has the Dimensity 900 chip as well as 4 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. On the other hand, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro has a newer and more powerful chip, the Dimensity 1100, and also has 8 gigabytes of RAM. Now this chip also provides an added benefit in that it supports USB-C video out. So in the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, it's got a 1080p signal through that USB port. You'll have to use an HDMI port for the Retroid Pocket 4. And of course, we'll test that here later in the video. Now, other than that, everything is going to be the same. So it has the same 4.7 inch display with a 750p resolution, and they both have Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 and a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. Now, there are going to be a lot of elements I'm not going to cover in this review because I already covered them in the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro review, and this shell and everything else is going to be exactly the same. And this video is like 43 minutes long, so if you want to do a deep dive into just the hardware and the feel of the device, I would recommend checking that one out. But in a quick summary, I will say this is a Nintendo Switch style design, but it is more D-pad centric in that it is above the left analog stick. The face buttons are also pretty great, they have a classic retro feel to them. And there's quite a few upgrades over the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, including analog triggers on the back. Now, because this is a D-pad centric device, that means that retro games are going to feel really natural and comfortable to play. However, I did find that games with a more modern control scheme, something that relies more on analog sticks like when you're playing game streaming, these are not going to be as great. And that's because the device is relatively flat, and so it's a little bit hard to grip this and then also reach the triggers in a comfortable way. So if you do plan on playing this style of game where you're going to be focusing mostly on the analog sticks, I would recommend checking out the Retroid Pocket Grips. These are $15, you can buy them at the time of purchase. I actually made a whole video about these as well. I'll leave a link down below. Now, in terms of overall size, this is a relatively small handheld, all things considered. It is a 4.7 inch screen, and I found it to be somewhere between like the XL versions of the 2DS or 3DS and then a Nintendo Switch Lite. To give it a similar comparison against Android based handhelds around the same price point, here's the Ambernic RG556. This one has a 5.5 inch screen, so same size as the Switch Lite, and as you can see, the device itself is quite a bit bigger. And I'll do a more in depth comparison between these two when I finish my Ambernic RG556 review sometime next week. Other devices in a similar price point are going to be the Odin Lite and the Odin Pro. These came out a couple years ago but have a 6 inch screen so they are quite a bit bigger. And these devices have often been on sale and of note the Odin Lite is the exact same chip as the Retroid Pocket 4 that we're reviewing here today. Now among all the Android handhelds that are currently available I would say the Odin 2 by far is the best but I would almost put it in a different category because the price is twice as much as the Retroid Pocket 4. It starts at $300 and the size is quite a bit bigger. Another Android device you might be interested in seeing a size comparison with is the new Ioneo Pocket S. I have this one on loan from the company. I'll be doing a video about this one in the coming week as well. At the end of the day, I would say the Retroid Pocket 4 is exactly what it's intending to be. After all, the word pocket is in the name, and it's a device that I would consider to be pocketable with some caveats. It really will depend on the size of your pockets, and then also bear in mind that the analog triggers are going to stick out quite a bit in your pants. Either way, it is definitely more on the pocketable and portable side than other handhelds within the same price category. Now there's good and bad with that. I think the 4.7 inch screen could be a little bit bigger. I think five or five and a half inches is perfect, but of course that would offset its pocketability by a little bit as well. Next, I wanna talk about a couple quirks with this Retroid Pocket 4 and 4 Pro. And the first thing I noticed in my 4 Pro review was that the screen was a little bit on the green side. Now since that review, it has been fixed with a software update and you can see the software tweak actually kick in as you start to boot it up. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro logo will go to a more clean white. 
So if you do watch that 4 Pro video and you hear my concerns about, you know, the color tint and everything else, that at least for me has been resolved at this point. And there are a couple other quirks worth noting. For example, if you try to scroll some text fairly quickly in a dark background, you'll actually find two different things going on. One is that as you're moving it, the text will actually get a little bit of a pink or a purple hue to it. And I'm not really sure what's going on there, but I know it has been reported to Retroid. The other part is that some people have noticed some ghosting with their screen. And again, this is most apparent when you're trying to scroll through some text. Let me slow it down to 25% speed so you can get a better idea. And I would say that little hue thing that happens where you get the text to be a little bit purple or pink is something that, yeah, I can kind of notice, but it's not something that ever affects my gameplay. And same thing with the ghosting. I can kind of see it here that it gets pretty blurry as I'm scrolling through, but when actually playing a game, I've never noticed it. Let's do a comparison against another device that doesn't have this reported problem, the Odin 2. And you'll see as I'm scrolling through, there definitely is a little bit of blur at times, but there's definitely no like purple or pink hue happening either. And here's the side by side. I think that yes, the text on the Odin is a little bit clearer. That means that as you're scrolling, it's still pretty legible. But on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, yeah, I can see that it is pretty blurry. Now for me personally, this isn't enough to break out a pitchfork and tell people that they can't buy this device, even though I have seen comments like that on Reddit, which is a super positive place to hang out. Either way, I thought it was worth noting, especially if you would find this kind of ghosting annoying. And the last issue worth addressing is the analog triggers on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Now this only happened on the very first batch of devices that went out, but apparently there was some sort of issue with the springs on them, and so many of them failed. Now this won't be an issue on the Retroid Pocket 4 because this one shipped later after they had actually fixed the spring problem. And if you bought a Retroid Pocket 4 Pro and it shipped before January 30th, they've extended the warranty on the triggers for two years. And if you do run into any issues, just contact them and they'll send you a replacement backplate, which will have the triggers already installed. And I think that's a pretty good compromise because all you really have to do at that point is just remove these four screws, take off the backplate, and then put the new one on. It's kind of beside the point for this specific review just because every Retroid Pocket 4 Pro will have those new springs, but I did want to bring that up in case you bought one of those older ones and you happen to be watching this video. Now on the software side, this is an Android-based device and it's running Android 11. The Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is running Android 13. And when it comes to getting it set up, the process is going to be very similar to the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. In fact, just recently I made a Retroid Pocket Starter Guide video. And this also is accompanied by a written guide. I'll leave all this stuff linked down below. So if you do happen to pick one of these up or the Pro, you'll have a full guide waiting for you to help you get up and running. And to be honest, really configuring one of these devices does take a little bit of time just because there are so many different emulator options. And so I go through all that stuff in the guide. For now, let's move over to testing out various systems to see how certain games are going to run. And specifically, I want to talk about the improvements from the previous Retroid Pocket 3 Plus to now. Now, of course, when it comes to classic gaming, you know, things like Retro Systems, Game Boy Advance, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, all these are going to play just fine, just like they did on the 3 Plus. You will get a little bit extra juice, which will enhance your retro gaming. For example, Super Nintendo widescreen games are available on this device, and they also worked on the 3 Plus, but there were some that got slowed down from time to time. Thankfully, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro has more than enough power to be able to handle these games no problem, and I've made a whole video guide about these as well. I'll also leave that link down below. Now, as we start moving into 3D-based systems, I did want to show just your kind of baseline expectations in terms of performance. To start, we'll talk about Nintendo 64. Basically, any game that you want to play can run at a 1080p resolution or higher. Bear in mind that the screen on this device is only a 750p resolution, so you might be wasting power if you go beyond that, but it is good to know that any Nintendo 64 game is going to work just fine as long as it's compatible with the emulator. It's going to be a similar story with Sega Dreamcast. You can run all of these at a 960p resolution and you can even use widescreen hacks, so you can get some really great performance here as well. Essentially, the Retro Pocket 4 can just chew through these systems, and so there's absolutely no problem running any of these games. Another system that runs really well is PlayStation Portable. In fact, all of these can run at a 4x or a 1080p resolution. And I've always felt like the Retroid Pocket devices are a perfect fit for the PSP. They have that same 16x9 aspect ratio, but then also the control scheme really works well for PSP gameplay. And a 4x resolution is perfect, because at a 3x it's going to be 720p, which is a little bit under the 750p resolution of the screen. And so here we can push it past the 750p resolution to ensure that we're making the most of all the pixels available on the screen. Even the hardest to run games like God of War Chains of Olympus still run at a 4x resolution no problem. Often you would have to downscale this. So so I think that yes, everything up to PlayStation Portable is going to work wonderfully on the Retroid Pocket 4. 
Now, I think the big question, and really the crux of this review, is how much improved it is over the 3 Plus, and how does it compare against others within the same price point? So I do want to do a little bit of benchmarking before we move into our next series of tests, and we're going to do the same 20-minute wildlife stress test on a bunch of different devices and compare the results. Now, honestly, this is probably not the perfect benchmark to be using when trying to compare from an emulation perspective, mostly because this is a GPU-intensive test. All the same, it does give us an apples-to-apples -apples comparison against other devices, so let's go ahead and dive in. So for our baseline, we'll start with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This is the last generation device that they had, and this one was also $150. And this test goes through 20 different one-minute loops, and you can see that the best loop score here was 729. Now on the Retroid Pocket 4, it's a bigger improvement. We're looking at 2042, so it's nearly three times as much in terms of score. And I think the next logical question is, okay, how does that compare against the 4 Pro if it's only $50 more? And here you can see it's quite a bit better. For an additional $50, we can get double the score of the Retroid Pocket 4. And that's pretty crazy that from the 4 to the 4 Pro, we're getting a 100% increase in score for only 33% increase in price. Some other comparisons worth looking at are going to be other devices with the similar chipset or price point. We'll start with the Odin Lite. Like I mentioned before, this has the exact same Dimensity 900 chipset, and as you can see, the score is about the same between the two. We also got a similar but slightly lower score from the Ambernick RG556. This one retails for about $185. So between these three, yeah, the score is very similar between them, and like I mentioned, I'll do deeper testing with the RG556 when I do that final review in the coming week. Now the other thing worth noting is just going to be the price-to-performance aspect for the Retro Pocket 4 compared to others. Like I already mentioned, you know, an additional $50 will give us 2.21x the performance with the Retro Pocket 4 Pro. That being said, when it comes to price and performance, I think the clear winner is still the Odin 2. Yes, it's more expensive, it starts at $300 plus shipping, but it does give you quite a lot more performance. We're looking at 6.65 times the performance of the Retroid Pocket 4, but of course it does cost twice as much, so it's really going to come down to what you can afford and what your budget looks like, but already we're seeing that for an additional $50, you will get a lot more performance with the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. One last thing worth mentioning about the whole performance benchmarks is that it also monitors your battery life. And between the Retro Pocket 4 and a 4 Pro, there is a bit of a difference. Both of these were running in the high performance mode with the smart fan on. And you can see that the Retro Pocket 4 lost 7% of battery in that time frame, whereas the Retro Pocket 4 Pro lost 15%. Now, I'm not saying that the Retro Pocket 4 has double the battery life of the 4 Pro, but at least when pushing it to those really high kind of performance standards, it does seem to drain less. And I've been testing the 4 for about a week at this point, and I found the average to be somewhere between 4 and 6 hours of gameplay, depending on what I'm playing. And I do play a lot of mixed stuff, so sometimes I'll play retro games, but then I'll push it up to like PSP at a 4x resolution. So I think just in a general use case, I would say maybe 4 hours is going to be the best average that you'll get right here. Okay, so now let's move into some of the performance testing of consoles that had problems running on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and beyond. And we'll start with Android gaming, and one thing to bear in mind is a lot of these Android games are GPU intensive. And given the fact that we were just testing a GPU-focused benchmark, and this one had about three times better performance at the 3 Plus, that does mean that a lot of Android games are gonna play better on the Retroid Pocket 4. Let's move into the stuff that's my bread and butter, which is going to be emulation. We'll start with Sega Saturn. This one was reliably okay when it came to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, but here I'm seeing a lot more consistent results on the Retroid Pocket 4. And as a baseline, I used the Yabasan Shiro 2 Pro standalone app at a native resolution. And I did find that the hard-to-run games, things like Sega Rally Championship and Die Hard Arcade, they played just fine. In fact, if you look at the top, you'll see a thing that says skip equals zero, and that's showing how much frame skipping it's using, and the fact that it's set at zero and very rarely goes away from that, that shows that it's performing really well. Now the main issue I found with this specific emulator is that compatibility wasn't perfect with this chipset and the GPU. And so there were games that caused some issues and I would have to resort to RetroArch instead. Now the Beetle Core is actually my favorite to use within all of the emulators, but it's a lot harder to run, and I didn't really find many games that played at full speed on that. However, the Yabasan Shiro Core within RetroArch did play well. So for example, Virtual Fighter 2 had a little bit of graphical glitches with the standalone emulator, but it played just fine in the RetroArch Core, so that's what I would use for certain games if they are causing issues. Issues. Unfortunately, I did find some games to be unplayable, like Last Bronx. As you can see here, it had a lot of graphical glitches in the standalone emulator, and unfortunately, the Beetle Core definitely couldn't play this at full speed, and the Yabasan Shiro Core had graphical issues too. So even using all the tools in my belt, I just wasn't able to find this game to be fully playable. On the bright side, it's not a performance issue, it's really something to do with the drivers, and so if this does improve compatibility in the future, you might be able to play this game. 
Moving on to Nintendo 3DS, I used the Citra Canary emulator, and I used this at a 2x resolution for every game. I didn't test a ton of games, but I did find that using the Vulcan backend with asynchronous shaders did give me some really great gameplay. In fact, every game that I tested played at a 2x resolution just fine. Now I bet that if you tried to play every single game in the catalog, you're going to run into compatibility issues, or maybe some just won't play at full speed. But at least in my testing, I didn't find any problems, so I do think that Nintendo 3DS is going to be pretty solid on the Retro Pocket 4. Moving on, let's talk about about Nintendo GameCube. I'm going to use the latest development build of Dolphin and I'm going to start at a 2x resolution. And this resolution is generally going to be above 750p and so it's going to take advantage of the, all the pixels available on the screen. And I'm also going to play the NTSC ROMs which means that they are going to have a target frame rate of 60 frames per second. And I found that the vast majority of the games that I tested played at a 2x resolution with relatively no issue whatsoever. One thing I do with this emulator is I go into graphics settings and then hacks and then I turn on an option that says VBI skip. What this means is as you're playing, if it does encounter some slowdown, it's not going to slow down the audio. And for me in particular, this is great because audio stuttering is one of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to emulation. And so even though some games might dip down to like 58, 57 frames here and there, it's still going to be a very playable experience. Now playability is a very subjective term, and so you may not like these results, but at least for me, I think it was good enough to kind of spark that joy of playing these old GameCube games on this device. That being said, it's not a perfect experience. Trying to play Metroid Prime at a 2x resolution isn't quite there. Instead, I would say the average is probably more around 58 frames per second, so you will see a little bit of slowdown from time to time. You've got a couple options. For example, you could drop it down to a 2x resolution, or you could try out the PAL ROM, because that's going to target 50 frames per second instead. And let me give you an example of why it might be in your interest to try out a PAL ROM. We're going to use F0GX as our example. For this one, we're running at a 1x or a native resolution, and it's actually running really well. For the most part, it's around 5960 frames per second, but it will drop down to like 57, 56 here and there. And I know that a lot of F0GX fans want to make sure they're getting that perfect 60 frames, and so this may not be acceptable. But if we switch over to the PAL ROM, we can actually get a lot better performance. Not only will it play at a consistent 50 frames per second, and maybe a couple dips down to 49 or 48 here and there, but you can actually play the game at a 2x resolution, so it's going to be double that upscale, it's going to look even better. So for me personally, I think that running this game at 50 frames per second using the PAL ROM is a great solution. So that's my recommendation, if you run into any game that has any performance issues, check to see if there's a PAL version of that ROM. It is an extra step to find and download and install that ROM, but it will give you much better performance. I also tried the same emulator to play Nintendo Wii games, and a lot of these played really well. Many games played just fine at a 2x resolution upscale, although some I did have to drop down to a native resolution like Super Mario Galaxy. So I would say that playability on Nintendo Wii is very similar to GameCube, but maybe a little bit harder to run. Next we'll move over to PlayStation 2, so for this I'm using what they call Neither SX2 Classic. And essentially this is an optimized version of the Aether SX2 emulator and the 3668 version, which is the last stable one. If you want to learn more about this one and actually build it yourself, I will leave a link to the GitHub down below. Either way, I did find that performance here was also pretty good, but not quite as good as it was with Dolphin and GameCube. So for example, many PlayStation 2 games played at a 2x resolution, including many games that I would really like to play, including Dark Cloud 2, and Vice City, and Jack and Daxter. Now other games, especially those that are 3D based platformers like Ratchet and Clank, these I did have to drop down to a 1x resolution, but even then I would say this is still a completely playable experience. Others would be a little bit more hit and miss, for example with Dragon Quest 8, this one mostly played at a full speed when running around, but there were times when it would dip down here and there. Now for me personally, when playing a role-playing game like this, I don't really mind a little bit of slowdown, but if you want a perfect experience, this one really isn't going to cut it. It's the same story with Sly Cooper. Unfortunately, even though the 3668 version of Neither SX2 is really the best version to play with this game, I couldn't get a super stable 100% speed. I was getting slowdown here and there. So definitely a good experience, but not perfect. And once I got to the higher tier, I had to make a lot of modifications, and even then, not every game was playable. With Burnout Revenge, I dropped it down to a 0.75x resolution, and it still wasn't playing at full speed. In fact, it was about 75% of the way there. So at that point, you'd have to do like emulation hacks or underclocking, things like that. And so let me give you an example of that experience. We're going to use God of War 2 as our example game. To start playing it in 1x resolution is pretty darn close. In fact, this is probably running about a 90 or 95% speed, but you are going to feel some slowdown here and there. And so we've got one of two major options. The first is going to be to use underclocking. So here I'm using a moderate underclock, and as a result, the game is playing at a more consistent 100% speed. But if you watch the gameplay closely, you'll see that it's a little bit frame skippy in the fact that it's not quite as smooth. 
So that's the big trade-off if you want to do underclocking is that with many games, it's not going to run as smoothly as it should. And so the other trick up our sleeve is to use a PAL ROM like we did with GameCube. And sure enough, playing God of War 2 with the PAL ROM at a 1x resolution with no underclocking runs at a pretty good frame rate. It would dip down here and there, but I would consider this to be a playable experience. And so that's what I would recommend doing again with PlayStation 2 if you run into any problems. In fact, even if a game runs at a relatively full speed with the NTSC ROM, it might be in your interest to try out the PAL ROM because it might enhance the experience. Let me use Gran Turismo 4 as my example. So this one plays at a 1x resolution and it's pretty darn good. However, if we switch over to the PAL ROM, we can boost it up to a 1.5x resolution in the settings. That's going to give us 768 vertical pixels, so that's going to be more than what the screen can handle. So at this point, we're maxing out the resolution of the screen and still getting some really stable performance. Now the trade-off here is that it's only running at 50 frames per second instead of 60, but I think it's well worth it. Okay, and finally, our last emulated system that I tested here in this review is going to be Nintendo Switch. Here we're going to use the latest Yuzu emulator, we're going to play everything in handheld mode. And right off the bat, I can tell you that only really lightweight games are going to play consistently. And sometimes it's hard to predict which games are going to play at full speed, but what I usually use as my own tell is to look at the file size of the game itself. And generally those that are of a smaller file size will be a little bit easier to run. So if you are specifically looking for lightweight Nintendo Switch games to play, you know, just something to kind of complement your overall emulation collection, then yes, I think you might find quite a few games that are run pretty well. Just bear in mind, it's not going to be a perfect experience for many of these games. For example, with Guacamelee, this one cannot get a consistent 60 frames per second. It's going to dip down to like 56 here and there. And once you start pushing past that, you're definitely going to see some issues. For example, Sea of Stars, which was kind of the upper limit of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, really isn't playable on the Retroid Pocket 4. Even if I drop down the resolution to 0.75x, it's still not playing anywhere close to 60 frames per second. So I would say Nintendo Switch is definitely not a system that plays well on the Retroid Pocket. 4, but there are some lightweight games that can kind of be used as a complement. And before we start wrapping up, one last thing I wanted to test is the HDMI out functionality. And to do this, you're going to need a micro HDMI adapter or a cable that has a micro HDMI at one end. Either way, just plug that into the HDMI port on the top of the device and it should boot directly into your monitor. It's going to max out at a 720p resolution, so it's going to be a little bit blurry depending on the screen that you're using. But for all intents and purposes, it's going to work out just fine. So if you want to plug this into a TV or a monitor, and then you can connect it to a Bluetooth controller and kind of consoleize the entire experience. And so this is always an added bonus with one of these devices because it kind of doubles its use cases. Anyway, I think we've done enough testing at this point, so let's start wrapping it up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Retro Pocket 4. And I'm going to keep the list here really short, and that's mostly because my Retroid Pocket 4 Pro review already went into detail about a lot of these other factors. So if anything, I'll just leave the first line saying that the overall quality on this device is very good. Especially when you consider that price point, we're getting a nice screen with good controls, even hall sensors for both these sticks and the triggers. It is really impressive how much quality we're packing into that price point. I also think it was a big upgrade from the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, especially considering that this was also $150 up until the RP4 launched. So essentially, we're just getting the same device but with upgraded components, better performance, and all that. I also found the battery life here to be pretty darn good, in fact better than the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. You're still going to get an average of about 4-6 to six hours depending on the types of games you play, and I think that's going to be plenty for most people. And then finally, even though I've brought it up a few times, that $150 price point is really a force to be reckoned with. You really can't find anything else at this price that's going to give you all this value in one. But of course that leads into my next point, which is the one thing I don't like about it, and that is that the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro also exists. Because when it comes down to it, for an additional $50 you're getting a lot more handheld. And I'm kind of of two minds here. I love the fact that Retroid released both the 4 and the 4 Pro at the same time, mostly because it nixed all the issues they had when they launched the 3 and then 3 months later they launched the 3 Plus. So I do appreciate the fact that they gave us choice right up front. However, given the fact that we have a big jump in performance and not a big increase in price does leave me thinking that the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is always going to be the one to get. The only time I can really see the 4 being a good recommendation over the 4 Pro is if you're really strapped for a budget and you also don't really mind playing those high-end systems. If you're good with capping out at most GameCube and PlayStation 2 games with a little bit of tweaking here and there, then yeah, the Retroid Pocket 4 is definitely going to suit those needs. But I think in all other respects, an additional $50 to future-proof this device a little bit more I think is well worth it. 
And so in summary, let's go back to those two questions I asked in the very beginning of the video. Is this device worth $150 and also is it worth spending $50 to get the 4 Pro? And for both of those questions, I think the answer is yes. If your budget is $150 plus shipping, then sure, the Retroid Pocket 4 is absolutely worth it. It's the best device you can buy at $150. But I also think that the additional $50 for the 4 Pro is also well worth it. I think in a world without the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, I would be screaming from the rooftop saying, hey, this thing is the best thing you can get for $150. Bucks. But instead, we're at a weird spot where I'm saying that maybe just get the $200 one instead. Anyway, that's about it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Are you going to be picking up the Retro Pocket 4 or is the 4 Pro more your speed? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.